things, yeah, one of the things that's good about psychoanalysis, it will just keep pressing, like, why, why, why? You know, and so if people just feel hopeless mm. and despairing, why? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by Anushka Gross. Uh, Ellie and I are very excited to talk to her. Uh, she is uh, probably known to many of you, but a really uh, important Lacanian psychoanalyst, uh, psychoanalyst and writer. You know, and, and also, aren't you, uh, Anushka? I think I've seen your music. <laughs> yeah have you that's that's unusual but yeah some people have <laughs> uh, and also I'll, I'll deep yeah. into the lore <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um <laughs> but but uh, a a practicing uh psychoanalyst as well as uh you know a writer of fantastic books of psychoanalytic theory and we're we're mostly going to talk today about the most recent uh guide to eco-anxiety which is uh anushka's uh kind of lockdown book i guess um and uh and and yeah, I guess we'll we'll ask you some questions and and, and talk about yeah politics and psychoanalysis psychoanalysis today. Uh, if that's good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> T- tell us how this book came about and and, uh, uh, and and what the kind of yeah the lockdown element of it is because that, that's what you sort of start the book with as well. Yeah. Well, it was. I mean, I got asked because I'd done a Guardian article about you know there was the Greenlandic survey that, that was all about the impact of climate change on people rather than on um, icebergs and so and um, and that was just starting to become a serious thing in 2019 or something that people were starting to think about so I got asked to write the book um, and went into sort of private lockdown in 2019 to write it in four months and then real lockdown happened immediately afterwards and so we had to make loads of changes to the book to sort of incorporate what was going on. Yeah, right. And 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 basically, it's uh, you know, in a nutshell, it's it's a kind of um, exploration of anxiety, I suppose, in a psychoanalytic yeah. sense, looking at Freud and and looking at psych- like Lacanian and Freudian ideas of what anxiety is, mm. uh, but applying this to the sort of enormous um, climate apocalypse anxiety that characterises mm. our culture, right? Yeah. Um, so you know, I guess as a as a sort of opening question, maybe something like you know, why is it and how do you feel like psychoanalysis and especially Lacanian psychoanalysis is is really important in understanding this kind of um, climate anxiety and apocalypse anxiety that we're kind of in? Well, I suppose one of the things that's particular about psychoanalysis that you don't get elsewhere is the emphasis on irrationality. And if you're trying to get people to do stuff that they're not doing and, um, you know, there are really good reasons for them to do it and they keep not doing it and they keep doing the other stuff that's going to fuck it up for everyone, then then psychoanalysis is, is one of the few theories that can at least have something to say about that. So so part of it was as comes out of a kind of frustration that, you know, climate change is, is happening and is, mm-hmm. is so obviously happening, but no one is doing anything about it. So to approach this problem from a psychoanalytic perspective, like what pathologically is it that yeah. people, why, why people aren't acting? Is, yeah, is that- Exactly. So in it, there's this fantastic guy called Harold Searles who was writing about it in the 70s, like this paper in 1971. And he says this thing that basically older people hate young people and they, could, you know, just want them to die. And so, I don't know. <laughs> like they hate being displaced and superseded. And so they can take something out on young people by, you know, I don't know, driving cars. Right, right. Mm. And, and even though that sounds like a mad thing to say, probably mm. at, at the level of desire, it yeah. It's a valid thing to say, right? And yeah. is, you know how psychoanalysis can help those kind of instincts, those impulses that you know, you know, rationally speaking, as you said, yeah, as you said, it's the irrational element. Rationally speaking, 
uh, if you ask a uh, you know a, a boomer, do you mm. want your children to burn? They're going to say no. But, but <laughs> nevertheless, you yeah, can get a libidinal exactly. pleasure from your children burning or something. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's great. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, what you know, what the book is a lot about as well. It, besides anxiety, is uh, trauma, right? Trauma mm. and mourning. It kind of, it has this dichotomy between mourning uh, and madness, or mourning and despair, and you know. When you say a phrase like memento mori, remember that you mm. are going to die. What does that mean if you don't mm. know how to mourn in general, right? I think, yeah. I think that, yeah. Because, you know, if you, I think that's also a question of how desire gets funneled. How yeah. it gets displaced. The death exactly. drive. The kill millennials yeah. death drive. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I'm really like, they're, they're just a really classic Freudian idea of preemptive mourning, that you mourn something before you've lost it. And, and that whole relation to the climate, it's like, well, we've done it now, we've done it. Yeah. We've done it. It's like, we haven't done it yet, you know. <laughs> and in a way, that preemptive mourning that you're just describing, is that a way of people not yeah. solving the problem? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you mourn it before it's dead. So it's, mm. yeah, so, so that sort of, Mm, yeah, no, I, I think that's a that's a great point, mm. and, and I'm interested what Edit said as well there about the, the question of because that chapter on guilt, you've got a chapter on guilt. I mean, for people who haven't looked at this book, I, I, I really, really, really recommend uh, people do. Uh, it's 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 a strangely set out book, Anushka. I wanted to ask you about that. <laughs> it's written like have... a like a psychology textbook a little bit. Textbook. Like, <laughs> <I've been laughs> the, well, in terms of like at the end, there's like kind of like it sums it up in questions, like activities you can do, right? Oh well. yeah, that's publishers. Yeah. That's publishers. That was it. Was I how mean, did I they do that? <laughs> yeah, I should probably shouldn't say this, but it was quite a fight to do that book. I mean, it was one of the most difficult books in terms of the sort of relationship. Um, you know, really? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I kind of weirdly liked that, but I thought it was your, your call and a kind of parody of textbooks. Yeah. You know, like sometimes in an in a yeah. A-level textbook, you get like a, a sort of grey square with a little case study in it or yeah. something. exactly. <laughs> and it was like that, but I was so embarrassed about it that every time I was doing it, I think, well, I have to take the piss out of it. It because otherwise I can't yeah. bear it. But, but, but it oddly works brilliantly. I thought it was, I thought it was <laughs> all right. <Thanks. laughs> <laughs> you're probably big on irony and stuff like that. I don't yeah, know. Well, it made me think that you were like a, this kind of nice person who really wanted to set it out for people, but not. But now I, but now I know that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they make me. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is kind of friendly. It has such a friendly tone here. <laughs> so let me out. take one of the. Okay, then in that case, like let's let's take one of them uh, bullet points from the chapter <laughs> overviews. <laughs> and, and and see, but because this one, I, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about in terms of anxiety and Freud. This is from the anxiety one, and it's mm. the first one says, if you're anxious about the planet, you're right to be. We need more people like you stay anxious. Right. Now, I think this is interesting because, you know, from the Freud from Freud's perspective on anxiety, you know, like Freud's work on anxiety and fear, where, you know, fear is like where there's a certain object that you're worried about. And this, you know, this this role of fear in the Freudian sense is is prominent in uh, mainstream British media, like, you know, fear of refugees or whatever. Like these are things that are coming and we can attach our anxiety to them and help organize our anxiety or whatever around these kind of objects of fear. Uh, whereas anxiety, you know, it's this more sort of um, originary, primary sort of uh, part of subjectivity. Uh, and your chapter on anxiety kind of goes into that uh, and says that, you know, basically, you know, this anxiety about the climate is to be, it should be legitimized. And the, one of the things I thought that you was really interesting in your chapter, I can't remember exactly where it is now, but that, you, you say something like if if that anxiety about the climate seems to be sliding into other aspects of your life, that's a good thing. Yeah. Not not a yeah, not a bad thing. So I thought we'd ask you about that. Like how, how do you see that kind of climate anxiety thing and what does all that mean? Well, I don't know, because that thing, I mean, especially even yeah, as a psychoanalyst writing about it, you do have this feeling like your colleagues are going to think you're nuts. You know, <laughs> that even in 2019, people were like, I've never seen a 
case of climate anxiety, what's all this? Um, and so that that madness that comes with it, when you you know when you start thinking about climate stuff, and then you start thinking about refugees, and then you start thinking about animals, and then bees, and you just you know wherever it goes, you start thinking about robot bees. They're inventing mm. robot bees. Why are they fucking inventing robot bees? And you just like everything you start to think about <laughs> sort of takes you there. And in a sense, that's right. That that kind of hyperconnectivity and and the slippage between everything that is the problem and that is yeah sort of how the anxiety manifests itself but also how how the real manifests itself <laughs> mm, mm-hmm. uh, so, so so when you say that just to, to expand a bit more on it like one of the problems you think is that these things all kind of seem to slide into each other or where it would be more healthy to to keep them separated and yeah, I think you yeah. can't kind of keep them separated. So in a sense, if everything's collapsing into everything else, that means you've understood it. Mm. And yeah, and if if you got don't it. think that, that means you haven't quite got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, can't, you can't protect your one little corner and close yourself off. As yeah. as Alfie has left as gamer, and me as me as a bad <laughs> gamer myself, you know, if you if you ignore that, if you ignore the map, Alfie, you just it, it just comes it all comes in on you doesn't it? <laughs> yeah <laughs> good way of putting it yeah, yeah no, and I was, I was trying to look for a quote that, that was in there uh, uh, but about the, the somebody thinking you, you can't buy the tuna because uh I don't know that it was something to do with tuna but like yeah I guess the point is these kind of micro feelings where you suddenly feel like oh you know on the one hand like I don't want to buy the tuna because it's it's part of a kind of um climate disastrous industry and then the next thought process is like something about yourself um whatever and yeah I, I think that's that's right I mean and it seems like an important point to make that weirdly nobody seems to make that like you know because we we do live in a world don't we where that the well I don't know what the word for these people are but people are keen to to say that those things are kind of identity gestures, you know, mm-hmm. not, not, not eat, no, being vegan or which you talk about, or mm-hmm. not buying uh, unsustainable clothes from corporations are sort of identity choices where, you know, you've chosen to do that simply because you want to be seen as somebody who's acting in this kind of way. But the way you look at that in relationship to anxiety is much more complex than that and much more sort of, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's sort of yeah. I I don't, I don't know kind of the point mm. I'm trying to arrive at, but it, it's, it's it's really sorry, it seems yeah. really important because that's that's just the head fuck that makes everybody not do things they probably should do. Like it's great not to, I don't know, eat from overfished seas and not to buy things that are made by workers that are getting killed and you know all that yeah. stuff. It's that is a good idea, and and that if we kind of trick ourselves out of it by saying oh it's just you know virtue signaling then then like who does that serve yeah no it's, it's, it's exactly right I, I totally agree with that it's I've always thought about that in the kind of t- psychoanalytic terms as kind of disavowal the way that mm. people are able to be like you know well I know that you know this apple phone was made by underpaid Chinese women in a factory who are now mm. suicidal and I know that Primark paid an Indonesian child to sew on every sequin but nevertheless I'm mm. still able to kind of wear this or or use this thing uh but but your book seems to yeah just ask people to think differently about that in a, in quite an interesting way i think yeah i hope and yeah and to feel sick at all times about everything <laughs> why, why why should i mourn if mourning feels bad isn't aren't i traumatizing myself <laughs> yeah you need to make myself yourself. sad i don't want to be sad <laughs> Well, it's quite funny that is one of the things that people come up against all the time like this idea of being positive that's why we had those things at the end of the chapters just so you could say really awful mm. stuff and then say something positive at the end of the chapter right <laughs> but but that is a good point of like I, I say that kind of facetiously because I'm a psychotherapist as well mm. like <laughs> so, but this is this is one of the questions which is uh, of trauma right of anxiety of these of these difficult emotions and especially the way that we're programmed to approach them is mm. we, we get rid of anxiety. Right. Yeah. And I like what you said in the book about channeling uh, Sarah Connor from Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little, yeah. In terms of it is, mm. it is actually positive, but I, I was hoping maybe you could speak to what, what is the, is there a psychological or psychoanalytical positive 
or what I don't know if you would call it a positive to feeling anxiety or feeling trauma uh, for the earth and for uh, uh, for our lives I, really, really. I don't know. I think anxiety, yeah, because isn't anxiety is a sort of call to action, and so that that can push you towards stuff I mean you know whatever the stuff is push you towards not doing things or push you towards doing things but it can cause you to act which I think is a good thing you know in relation to climate stuff but trauma is more difficult I mm. guess and yeah the, the idea of preemptive trauma which I think is re um is a good idea you know the one about all the climate scientists being traumatized by things that haven't happened yet <laughs> and, yeah and, right. and what what does that mean is that yeah is that a proper concept but I think it is I think yeah well yeah it takes away our future doesn't it the preemptive trauma yeah. if we yeah. say oh this is already this is already gone or you know mm. another way in terms of you know death anxiety I am already gone we are yeah. already gone so ergo let's make everything gone let's let's not pay attention to the climate yeah, exactly. And all that stuff. I like really old fashioned theory, but that you know all the um is he called Becker, the the immortality project guy, the the guy who speaks about um sort of warding yeah. things off with so yeah, so you're traumatized and you do something create you know, you buy a cashmere jumper or you do something completely kind of um not helpful to the thing you're worried about, <laughs> but it helps you on some other level. This this idea of yeah, immortality projects being means of defending yourself psychically against things you don't like the sound of. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so I many immortality that's... projects. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, one of the things related to this, but not directly, that I wanted to ask about was you know a lot of the book also. One of the things I found surprising reading this was that there's quite a lot of attention given to medication, uh, mm. forms of medication, different kinds of medication, and also other forms of therapy like cognitive behavioral therapy and things like that. More mm. kind of like, I don't know, uh, normative state endorsed or whatever uh, forms mm. of therapy. So, so I thought about asking about that and, and, where, and, and why you think that psychoanalysis is indeed like the thing that's necessary and what it can do that, because one of the things I think you show is there's a lot of problems with the way, not just the, more i guess the the point about the sort of american americanized but also british drug industry is is more well trodden but also talking therapy like cognitive behavioral therapy have has a number of kind of problems and issues and the way it medicalizes and stuff and your your book kind of counters all that in relation to all this stuff as well mm. yes but i mean the thing that's difficult is that in a way there are there are sort of what is it ways and reasons for doing things that um are not sort of initially apparent. So, so things like, I don't know, taking SSRIs because you're afraid of um, the end of the world. You, you could say, well, that's a really stupid idea because <laughs> that if you just get more comfortable with the idea of the end of the world, then, you know, <laughs> why should you? That's that's crazy. But um, that is totally kind of one flew of the cuckoo's nest stuff. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if these things really are happening and you have a certain amount of power to act and there are things you can do, sort of how, how do you tolerate an impossible problem? And if you can tolerate it slightly better by being slightly less incapacitated by fear, that then maybe you'll be able to do something better. So it's, it was more just not to discount all the, the sort of normative medicalized treatments and say, well, there might be, you know, something you can do with that. There's something you can do with drugs, something you can do with CBT that, you know, that it's not just to be monolithic and say you have to do psychoanalysis because that's the best one because obviously not that many people are going to do it yeah right no obviously that's so yeah 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 and, and okay so sorry go on Elliot. yeah well yeah i i think that is true that's definitely true but luckily there's shows like this where people can get <laughs> introduced yeah it's like sure mm. most people will get Cognitive behavioral treatments, you lower mm. your anxiety from seven to three and from seven days a week to two, sure. Yeah. But nonetheless, it's it's good to be able to talk, you know, you won't get the state yeah. ever supporting you to say, well, what should our relationship to death be? And they'll say, yeah. oh, why should your insurance cover that? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, this is this is the other impossible problem. I, I like, you know, yeah, we're facing think, impossible yeah. problems are, you know, death. <laughs> Does does our death mean the death of the world should also follow with us, right? Mm. Uh, does that mean we if should we if we're ambivalent about our death, then the, are we ambivalent about the world's death? Or mm. and like you know, it's all displaced because we're not ambivalent, we're terrified, or 
where, mm. we, you know, you could say that dragging the world down with us is a sort of madness, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. But I wonder, I, yeah. No, no, please. Well, it's, it's one of the promises of, of coming at this psychoanalytically is that at least while it all goes wrong, you'll have a really good conversation about it. Whereas if you do CBT, right. you won't. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I, I think you also see a, a a whole generation of people who who likely have some do some kind of medicinal stuff plus maybe CBT, but who yeah. supplement their that with a kind of precarious version of psychoanalysis that comes through YouTube and you know interviews yeah. like this. You know, so you know this kind of idea of psychoanalysis as like. You know, that's for the elites who can afford this kind of extremely that mm. that is a little bit of a an old view of it. Cause yeah. most people probably under probably sort of self-supplement, even like loads mm. of precarious workers self-supplement their their medical diagnosis with like sort yes. of secondhand psychoanalysis and things from you know, so th this kind of distinction between the affordable CBT mm. and the yeah, you know, it doesn't seem so useful. I know. And also CBT can be, I mean, if you do it privately, it's really expensive, much more than psychoanalysis. And um, psychoanalysis is sort of um, held together by loads of precarious trainees who will see you for a tenor. So, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as the, as, I guess that's what I was thinking, that the more precarious everything becomes, mm. you know. The, how the, how yeah, precarious the, workers yeah. can work for your psychoanalytic treatment. <laughs> yeah. That is <laughs> That, is, that well, it's a good point yeah. though. There are a lot of look up psychoanalysis trainees and interns. <laughs> You're on a budget. You're yeah, on a budget exactly. and want some psychoanalysis. They're out there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> they need hours. Yeah. But um, right. I mean, I mean, I think we should get to to, to sort of try to get to like that the sort of heart of this thing. Like, why? What is it that means that psychoanalysis can help? climate change like that's i suppose something that some readers would just think you know these are two, and there's, yeah yeah and this is part of what we're talking about i suppose you know you, you think of psychoanalysis and people immediately think of somebody sort of lying on the couch talking mm. about their you know their own personal problems it's it's always had this kind of reputation you know despite what you might think of lacan and everything as, as being this kind of you know you know yeah, well, the opposite of the thing that makes you to, to be in, to be a, a climate change activist or to, to take proactive steps about climate change, one needs to have the absolute opposite attitude, the attitude of like, I matter the least in, in this yeah. set of concerns. So how do you sort of tie together those two things, uh, which I think is a good thing. To it's, a, it's a good question. <laughs> but, um, no, but hasn't psychoanalysis is like annoying for so many different reasons, but obviously it's annoying because, you, you know, people focus on themselves and think about themselves and uh, but it's also annoying because it's this theory of everything you can think about everything with psychoanalysis you know politics everything money whatever you can you can think about it all and and so Don because unconscious it, motives yeah yeah exactly <laughs> exactly sort of financial systems the irrationality of financial systems and the human beings that that sort of you know operate them or whatever that yeah so so you can psychoanalysis is sort of extreme at both ends as this sort of pan theory thing at the same time as being all about the individual but uh, you know that i get i mean i tried to do it in the book where, to really you know see where those things intersect or how, how the i the think it does it quite well in fact in terms of, <laughs> yeah, well in terms cool. of That's yeah the book's talking. explanation <laughs> i mean to get stuck in this discourse that we have to have this nihilistic despair view of mm. the environment rather than participating uh, actively in some sort of environmental groups like you mentioned extinction mm. rebellion which is very popular in the uk right um mm. and yeah i think psychoanalysis can 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 help us change the kind of discourse which is a right now i would say the most popular climate change discourse is is a despair discourse master yeah uh you know this is happening you're too small to do anything from, mm. from every from you know from climate change from zizek you know, mm. you know our lord and savior <laughs> <Right>? yeah. <laughs> uh anyway no um but no really in term, but there is a kind of um discourse of nihilism that gets built up and i think psychoanalysis and the way you describe even participating you know calling calling to action the 
reason reason to act, right? Mm. Um, I think that's a I think that's a great project. Um, the project of hope, you, you act of hope, and mm. right. yeah, I suppose. I mean, it's yeah one of the things that's good about psychoanalysis. It will just keep pressing, like why, 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 you know. And so if people just feel hopeless mm. and despairing, why, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and it's maybe, not so yeah. it's not so annoying when it's despair, right? The why it's like yeah. psychoanalysis so annoying. Yeah. Right? And you're like, oh, it's all <laughs> so meaningless. I'm gonna die, and everything's yeah. the worst. Why? Yeah, oh. exactly. <laughs> Happy psychoanalysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I, I still think we need to sort of, yeah. Uh, what what think about like you know, uh, how, how can it, yeah, like, how could, you know, so so taking this cycle, I, I agree with Elliot, and I, 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 I totally think that this is done great in the book, but, but like, to, to people who haven't read the book, like, um, I just feel like this instinct, that there'll, there'll be this instinct that psychoanalysis isn't going to help climate change, and I think, mm. you know, it'd be good to talk a bit about, like, yeah how how exactly thinking psychoanalytically about our own because the way your book approached it I think is right that like you know it's actually a question of feeling and and some of the things we think and that not so much we think but that we feel about mm. the climate are worth yeah this is what I took that some of the things we not just what we think is happening with the climate but what we feel is happening with the climate is also important and yeah. this was the early thing with anxiety and also guilt and other kinds yeah. of we, we do feel this mixture of things from anxiety to fear to guilt mm. about the climate. And, and your book kind of makes a case that those feelings can be really harnessed and, and, and used in a positive way. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, can, can you say more about that? And, <laughs> yeah, so I think maybe the answer is that, in a way, the book's not that psychoanalytic or, or that thing in the, I think it's, is it in the introduction, but about Jane Austen, that, um, that in a sense, if, you know, if the idea is to do, that internal states matter and that you can do something about them, that you're not just completely beholden to your internal states, there, there's, you know, you can... I don't know, think, act, do, do all sorts of things to try to move them around. And, and Freud can sometimes be a bit fatalistic about that, a bit like, you know, interminable, <laughs> all that. But, um, but Jane Austen, I thought, is, in a way, she's better. She's like, if you're crap, then don't be crap. Like, stop it. <laughs> and, and seems to have much um, more of an idea that, that things can shift in people and that they can try to be better or they can you know I don't know do stuff about yeah, their internal worlds and and so to me yeah it's not to say psychoanalysis mm. is the best say it can get you a certain way but you know there are other people who think really well about these things and maybe Jane Austen does it better <laughs> yeah I definitely agree with you know you can't just guarantee somebody to have mm. infinite good hot takes about psychoanalysis <laughs> even if it's even Freud even Lacan even Freud yeah yeah, yeah. Um, no no absolutely it's unsurprising that a great uh, writer would have these psychoanalytic insights. If you're talking psychoanalysis is like Alfie was saying, psychoanalysis is not just being on the couch. It's a whole, it's a whole method, right? It's a, yeah. whole, it's a whole shift of uh, discourse of, mm. of questioning, of pushing. Um, and how do you, how do you push? You know, yeah. The, That's such psychoanalysis. Good... Yeah. Yeah, because whether the push all happens sort of in in the psychoanalysis or whether it happens elsewhere, like maybe in psychoanalysis, you get to a point where you've sort of got why you're stuck or why things are going wrong. But the thing that then might make you do something else is is sort of post psychoanalysis. That's, you know, psychoanalysis brings you to the point of thinking, shit, I've got to do something about this. And then maybe you do. <laughs> mm. There is yeah. a good. I think I believe that there are good. There are good causes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right. I think this is like this. I think that this is like a very simple statement. But I think in psychoanalysis we can lose, uh, or sometimes we lose sight of it, or just in life mm -hmm. we lose sight of it. Right. Which is like you said, mm -hmm. Jane Austen's dynamic kind of self that you can change and do something about your internal state. But, you know, you can, despite the reality of the unconscious and anxiety, mm. you can actually work for a good cause and it isn't just delusion. Well, yeah. It's good, but, but what are your other motives? It doesn't, you know, to a certain yeah. extent, it doesn't really matter. You can actually be working for positive change. 
Yeah, exactly. And Freud seems to be really into all that stuff as well. You know, he loves yeah, civilization. Like you can see that it's painful and uncomfortable yeah. and difficult to adapt to, but he's into it. <laughs> he does. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, no, that's quite right. No, and and I, I suppose in one of the things as well, that, you know, was it was interesting to me about this whole approach is that, I mean, like we were joking earlier about the, um, you know, the 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 way the publisher puts the the case studies in the you know grey boxes but 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 those aspects are interesting because it brings you know I mean obviously Freud does that kind of in his writing Mm. um but you your book also does do this kind of like um you know it it refers to the actual process of of being a psychoanalyst and what certain people would have thought I can't remember the guy's name is it Liam uh for example one of the guys it's like a a case study yeah, yeah, in the box. Yeah, Liam. Uh, you know, we've got these case studies, the climate grief case studies. So, but, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, I suppose the question I want to ask is, like, loads of it is informed by the theoretical aspects. Your interest in Lacanian psychoanalysis, Marxism, whatever, and other aspects is informed by, you know, what was actually said to you or or what actually people are thinking and feeling. And, and you know, and so how does that all kind of... <sighs> You know, that is in psychoanalysis, that's the thing, isn't it? Like people even say to you when you say you're you work in psychoanalysis, they say theory or practice, you know. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but you yeah. don't do that, you do both. Yeah, but I really, I mean, I do, that's one of the things I love about clinical psychoanalysis is that, you know, people are going to come and um, mess up what you think about theory. <laughs> and and that's a really good thing. Or, or, or you're going to have to, you know, struggle to see how, if theory is, worthwhile worth anything then you're going to have Absolutely. to struggle to see how it appears in the clinic or not or yeah trauma when you encounter trauma in a clinical setting it mm. radically challenges your notions of uh, philosophy you know mm. if you're if you're philosophically inclined and you go into psychotherapy and then you're dealing with anxiety yeah. and traumatic uh, traumatic yeah. reactions you're like oh wow this is about trauma Right. Yeah, but and that's why it's good to analyze what what where is the trauma located? Is tr- the trauma mm-hmm. located? And so often it's located in the future. It's a yeah. kind of false. It's a false bringing together of the future in a traumatic kind of form. Mm. Right. Mm. And yeah. and do you have in your work sometimes you just can't believe how true the theory is? I remember meeting someone once who was a fetishist who within five minutes said like my mom was all over me as a kid and it was just like this is not someone who reads Freud or things like that and you just think wow actually it's true and it's amazing yeah so you sort of see a a, 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 a several different things one sometimes you see something that happens there in the clinician clinical sense that you just really sort of speaks to the theory in, mm. in a way that's and other times you feel thrown off by yeah. the way in which that the what's appeared in the clinic has doesn't doesn't chime I suppose with is that would that be right yeah totally well like this Lacanian dogma for years and years and years that um that trans people were necessarily psychotic because they had the idea, you know, that operating on the body um, meant there was a lack of a question which indicated to psychosis. And it's, it's just rubbish. Like, if you work with trans people, that's not true. And <laughs> and so, yeah, you wonder how mm. people supported such a bad theory for such a long time because they must have been meeting people in their practice who, who disproved it. That, that's it's important um, to touch grass. Touch grass if you're... Trans people are psychotic because they don't have a question. It's like it's go so outside. stupid. Go yeah, outside. exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Mm. I mean, that's super interesting because we were just talking to to we were interviewing Bonnie Rambatan, who's a sort mm. of um, a psychoanalytic theory, but a, a trans activist about mm. her experiences of um, this exact thing, and and mm. um, yeah, they were also saying that. Um, you know, yeah, psychoanalysis in the theory side tends to have a, a large amount of problems with this kind mm. of thing. Uh, but but then in practice, it, it doesn't. You know, in practice, it can be more helpful, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny to think that you could be seeing an analyst who is sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, yeah another psychotic trans person it's crazy, but you, isn't it? yeah it's crazy but it, it, as as the person speaks to them maybe you wouldn't know that they had this rubbish erroneous idea and you'd find yeah. them a perfectly good person to speak to <laughs> that's, that's the proper weirdness of psychoanalysis yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that never, is, right. yeah. yeah. Well, it's so scary the amount of ideology. You know, when people do talk mm. about Jordan Peterson having mm. bad ideology for a psychologist, all I can mm. think of is, oh, I've met so much worse. <laughs> yes. I've known, I've known, I've known therapists who you know got mm. their ideology from Frogger U YouTube videos. Older mm. therapists as well, like just really, like. Mm. <laughs> You know, you know, you know, the analyst discourse can never be guaranteed. You know, you're never. Yeah. Uh, that's why it, it isn't, you know, the, Lacan did even with whatever he thought or whatever the school thought he did kind of give the gift of the analytic mm. discourse. Right. Staying with the enjoyment. You you don't actually, yeah. you know, even if you have a chauvinistic view, you don't actually have to do a master discourse, a university discourse. Yes. And who knows if yeah. they actually don't. But um, let, let me ask you both this then that, you know, I mean, I, I'm a lecturer and you guys are therapists. Um, and, you know, one of the things we often have, and I think this is stupid, that, you know, as lecturers, we're told, you know, we shouldn't make our politics too visible or, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's absolute nonsense because all my students know I'm a raging lefty. Uh, but but nevertheless, you know, we don't like say, uh, you know, you know, this is our we don't explicitly say on our bios, for example, on the university page, you know, Marxist thinker or something. We say like interested in researching Marxism or whatever, you know. Um, so and, and but then and I wondered how that sort of plays out in the therapy context and also whether, you know, in a sense, this like you, you were saying, uh, you know, Perhaps it is more honest if people know, because I do I do see that, like people saying, you know, left Lacanian thinker or whatever, you know. So, mm. I mean, maybe it is important for people's, or, or do you think as, as practicing therapists, you know, politics belongs on the outside of it? Or, or do you think, you know, we need to be up front and say, yeah, or, you know, I'm socialist and a psychotherapist or whatever. I don't know. What do you think about that? <laughs> oh, well, I... I don't if you write stuff, then you can't hide it. So there's no point. Because I know, yeah, they, those yeah. <laughs> ideas about objectivity and yeah, neutrality and stuff. Maybe some analysts can still do that, but I, I can't I've lost it. So yeah, I don't know. Elliot, what how do you do it? <laughs> I, mean, uh, I I I think well I I, I remember I, I I found myself uh get I, I i was called there was a there's a right-wing therapist socialist therapist watch website and i was i was, wow. I was shocked and wow. also secretly delighted i was on it yay <laughs> um, that's amazing and, well, and it said it was um you know i could immediately tell they didn't read my book um because mm. you know a left-wing politic is is a politic of liberation of freedom right mm. um it's not about it's not about like a right wing person comes into your clinic and you just say, you're a fucking idiot. Get out of here. Right. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, you talk about you talk about the beliefs, of, you know, you talk about the other. Why is the other other uh, scary? Why is what what's the trauma that they experienced? Right. And I, I think this is what's fundamentally misunderstood. And Alfie, you make a really good point about, you know, they want us to lie about our views. <laughs> right? They want us. They want us to mythologize ourselves as if we are, because it gives us authority. Right? It'll give you authority mm -hmm. as a professor, me as a therapist, to to uh, obscure our identity until we're just nameless, faceless, authority wielding mm -hmm. psychoanalyst, psychotherapist, mm -hmm. professor. Right? It is the un university discourse, is it not? Um, the, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but. but, but yeah, but I guess I guess when I was asking that, I was I was wondering whether you see the same. I would, and I guess I think this is the case, even though I don't know. But I I think you guys probably see the same structures, like you know, people coming to you who are you know explicit socialists or whatever, people coming to you who are fascists or whatever, but basically having the same structural kind of um, you know ways of thinking. Uh, and I wonder whether, as analysts, you see that and therefore see connections between the right and the left that you might not otherwise, that other people might not see. And the, when I was reading Anushka's chapter, your chapter, Anushka, on, on the anxiety at the start of the book, I was also thinking this climate denier versus climate anxiety and how mm. you know, aren't they structurally kind of the same you yeah know, i think so liberal left who who, mm. who who feels anxious about the coming apocalypse and this kind of climate denier on the so-called right mm. but 
structurally speaking, there are patterns here that can be... What do you think of all that? Yes, I, no, I think that's exactly right. And I, I think, yeah, denial might just, if your anxiety manifests as a denial, then that's just, that's how you sort of uh, metabolize your anxiety. Because <laughs> I think, I mean, it would be rare for a person not, not to know that certain things go on in the world. <laughs> and so, yeah, if they've got that that block, then that's what, it was funny, I was thinking about it in terms of gender and the, um, men are from Mars thing. I was talking about it the other Ooh. day. And, the, the, you know, this idea that a man has to go to the shed and a woman's sort of chasing after him into the garden. <laughs> but that, that presumably both people are responding to anxiety in different ways. But it's it's almost like from the same impulse to different actions that then, um, you know, interrupt and problematize each other. Mm. Mm. And, and have you had, like complete fascists turn up and ask yes. for advice <laughs> yes. and, and, and and does that how does that like compare to um i mean i suppose you know i mean you've got a, a section there about post-traumatic stress and stuff i mean and and looking at all these kind of you know we're, we're talking about quite serious trauma you know we're not we're not talking about just you know everyday stuff and in the trauma chapter you you kind of get into that kind of thing um you know, so yeah, I mean, how so, so I guess I'm trying to get a bit more to the bottom of like how do politics inform it? Like, how is it possible? I, I suppose, from a non um, a non clinician's perspective, the, this question seems prominent. Like, how is it possible to help someone through their trauma when they have a kind of fascist or uh, right wing approach when you yourself have these kind of strong socialist Marxist left values? Yeah, no, I think it's a really difficult thing. It's a really difficult thing to work with, especially if they know from looking you up where you're coming from. And because, you know, there's this sort of heroism in psychoanalysis around that kind of ob objectivity or be, and, and also being able to love a person that you hate. Like if someone comes in and it's like a sort of raving misogynist who does really terrible things to their female partners or whatever, then, then you're meant to cut, almost like to love them and that's going to bring them around to a different position. But sometimes maybe if you don't love them, maybe you're not the best person to work with them. Like maybe they should work with someone who's not going to despise them. Right, right. So, no, yeah, mm. right. I mean, but then, yeah, but then maybe they shouldn't. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's a really difficult thing. I think it really comes down to what you can stomach. Like maybe you can only, I can only have one big oh, yeah. misogynist on my books at any given moment. Or, <laughs> what, yeah, I don't right. know, something like that. <laughs> like if you have to see them all day. Then... You should put that on the website. With, <laughs> well, depending on how odious your actions or your views yeah. are, you'll be barred from certain clinics, right? I mean, some people... Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, they bar domestic violence perpetrators like, mm. uh, you know, you're going through a roster and here's a domestic violence perpetrator. And, you know, if you do get people who are violent, mm. um, it is yeah, it is can't. it can be it can be yeah. scary. Uh, it dep You know, there there is treating them. I, I worked with a guy who was really good at treating very violent, very um, vicious. Who knows what they're idiot fascists wouldn't even describe them because they're just violent. Um, you know, um, and you know, you, you sit down with them, right? Like you said, do you love them? Sometimes you don't necessarily have to love them, but sitting down with them is enough because mm. most people, plenty yeah. of people have not sat down with them, right? Mm. Plenty of people have, have vacated the premises, uh, based on their, based on even their safety, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Isn't that, I can't watch it, but the end of The Sopranos is kind of about that, that, that she just says after, you know, I've been listening to you for ages. Is that what it's about? I think <laughs> apparently that's what it's about. Yeah, that's the ending there. It, she thinks she's sort of enabling him by listening to him, so Ooh. she stops. <laughs> that's interesting, yeah, because, yeah, I mean, I can I can certainly see all these problems. Anyway, yeah. Uh, no, I thought what, what would be good to finish about one thing we haven't covered... Um, you know, I mean, this the, the book is, um, you know, I, I think um, absolutely brilliant. And one of the things I think was really interesting is the end where, you know, it's kind of like in the style, and we talked about, the, I don't know about the role of the publisher in this either, but it's kind of in the style of self-help, you know, mm. and uh, and in this kind of like, you know, you, you finish with these, I don't know if it's 15, like different kind of injunctions, like or different like kind of advice, like 
like just one paragraph each, like, you know, uh, have feelings, enjoy nature, be grateful, be a good friend. You, de- you know, these are feel the floor. I think that's important. You know, take break. You know, the, and these are, but, but, so I wanted to ask about those, like, which come towards the end of the book. Uh, and also, but to how to think about this in relation to like self help discourse, because obviously you're also critical of self help discourse and mm. happiness industry and all that kind of thing. And we, we, we accidentally mentioned Jordan Peterson, you know, in a way, one of the ills of contemporary society is this kind of self help rhetoric. But, but you kind of do that, but in a kind of uh, your own and quite subversive way, I guess. So, you know, talk, tell us what you think about like all that, the kind of books that tell you to have feelings and enjoy nature and how yours is kind of different <laughs> to those. <laughs> I really don't know. But I think this maybe it is a sort of dialectical thing, like because my publisher wanted one kind of book and I wanted a different kind of book. And so we argued a lot and we got that book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you didn't want to do me. <laughs> what, no, but I was what, happy. Would the, what would the book look like if it was your book? What 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 would have been different? Um, like purely well, your... none of the good bits would be there it would be just no, bo- <laughs> no boxes nothing no we no happiness bo- <laughs> boxes and happiness and yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but again I read this as a kind of parody of self-help yeah. books. <laughs> well, I was kind of glad she made me do it in the end I thought well <laughs> when you <laughs> said funny. when you when you said Greta is an anagram mm. for great was that taking the piss well, because it was in one of the little boxes. <laughs> <laughs> just anything in the box, just read it in a slightly different way. That's all. all. Right. Yeah, well, that's what the box is for, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's in a box. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but no, but seriously, I do think there's something here. You know, the book finishes with, you know, some advice for like how to behave, but also, you know, it's also a book that's not about the fact that it's, I suppose, to get to the heart of it, right, with, with the self-help discourse, the main primary, the, 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 the single main issue is that it makes it about you instead of capitalism and mm. injustice or patriarchy or whatever. So, mm. you know, it, it takes the attention away from the bigger systems mm. that are causing your life to be shit and mm. focuses the attention on you and your ability to improve your own personal situation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Alfie, like people have to reflect on it, right? You don't just get, you, you can't simply foreclose your own existence and mm. say you can be a pure, a pure other, right? And I no, think no, that's no. what the, that's what the book does so well, which is it, it's it, ultimately it is a push against foreclosure in terms of you foreclose, I can do anything about climate. You foreclose that climate is uh, weird, all doomed, right? And this, you know, the whole book is a push against that i know when you when you talk about a book you've written maybe it's easier it's difficult in the interview to remember all the different parts yeah. and the good parts so i'm doing that a little bit Thanks. I'm making a, Thanks. like supplementing it because it is good uh, you know and is well written and it has a lot of thorough oh, yeah. arguments against foreclosing climate discourse and climate despair right um, yeah thank you already gone yeah but what it, what it makes me think about, you know, the way Freud's really anti-yoga and civilization is discontents. He just goes on like a few times about how <laughs> shit yoga is. <laughs> and it's just, it's quite random because you could be into psychoanalysis and take that really seriously and do yoga. And in fact, a lot of psychoanalysts do because otherwise, how would you sit in a chair all day if you don't do something else? Like, yeah, if you mm. make psychoanalysis your, your only thing, then then you're in trouble. Sure. What would you say now about a scientist who one of their star lecturers was giving a lecture and then they, they at the very end they had their own unique idea and they stated it and then the, the, sci- the top scientist just kicked them out because Freud, <laughs> because Freud did that quite often. Right. So it's like, you know, Freud yeah. is like, he's not, he's not yeah. the, pro- the, the ultimate no. prophet of psychoanalysis, you know, he's no, definitely no. important with, but I mean, mm. you can't just model yeah life exactly. after his and be like oh that's healthy right yeah exactly <laughs> plenty I'm of room for goodness in psychoanalysis you know, yeah no I'm, I'm coming i've come around you know i'm looking through all these uh <laughs> and i'm thinking yeah, i do need to do these things <laughs> <laughs> but i think you're right i mean i think that could be a problem but maybe maybe i felt i'd got away with it like making it so much about politics that was just total yeah. managed to get that in and so maybe by the end i was just ground down and i was like yeah, it's yeah all well no just, no but, but I, do I, some I, deep I, breathing. 
I'm sure it's not that though, because <laughs> it is a deep breathing. <laughs> I'm sure, that, yeah, because you know, at the end of the day, yeah, you know, you're you're in this political mess, but you still have to cope, you know. So mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, I got, I have, I have one thing. Which, okay, last which, one. Which I mentioned already. <laughs> which was, I love that myth is embodied. We t- I said this briefly before we went live, but your vagus nerve, uh, it's written in the eco-anxiety book. When you do the deep breath, you're saying, you're telling your body, my blood pressure is too high. And in a formal sense, you're lying to your body. Mm, it's amazing. Which I, which, I, which I think is really, I think it's amazing that myth is not just something that, um, you know, it's not just something that's, that's out there and is fake and we're deluding ourselves. But in Mm -hmm. fact, you know, myth is just embodied by us. Right. And insofar as um, we, we try to craft a story, it has a sense of completeness and despair creeps in and destroys it. Like we can do something for the environment and then despair says, no, you can't do anything. No, you're not anybody. Who are you? Everything you do, right. This is despair creeping in, but it's worth maybe giving our embodying some myth <laughs> right because yeah. it's not just, yeah. it's not just nothing it's it is a core constituent of who we are yeah exactly and I love that sort of layering that you know it's like this sort of old technique and it's you just breathe and uh, but and then there's all this talk about the machines that they wire you up to to show that your lies are working <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're lying to your body successfully you've yeah yeah we can now. see it on the ground but, but there's something to the end res- the purpose is not the lie the purpose is mm-hmm. okay your blood pressure but ultimately there's a cause and the cause is you're gonna relax right now you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna breathe yeah. your blood pressure. you've gone through a lot of trauma despair mm-hmm. you've been you've been anxious about the earth you just read ink uh, eco anxiety right <laughs> <laughs> After that book, you need to take a deep breath and uh, know, live not... your body or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not join it? Why not do do something good for the env- environment? I remember, well, yeah. you know, talk, yeah. even talking with people. I, I as a jaded leftist, I remember hearing something about even consuming ethically. Like I support this corporation over this one because they do some things, and I mean, immediately my entire. Um, jaded mm. self, despair self came out and was like, Are you fucking kidding me? You mm. support one corporation over other? You're going to take the time to do that? But you know, that really made me, immediately I was thinking, as I was thinking the despair discourse, I'm like, what am I saying? Like, why am, mm. I, why am I so insistent that you can't even do a, a, a base good thing, right? I don't think you have to be deluding yourself that it takes a mass systemic change to even to participate in yeah. in the solution, right? Yeah, the yeah, hope, exactly. The act of hope. Act of yeah, hope yeah. you write about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I did read, um, talking of hope, I did, I did when I was, like, um, looking at your stuff in Ishka, I did find, like, one weird article that called you the shrink who believes in love. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I thought that was really interesting. Um that was but, uh, that was Otto Rank's insult for Freud as well. Oh, really? The love, really? Love well, therapy. He wrote in, in his book Will Therapy. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but that was really good. Um, I thought that was great, and also full of and I and I think also that you know the book is really really great, and you know everyone should should read it. And yeah, I, I think that um, despite my earlier just criticism of self help, I think that there's a real need for this kind of stuff and this kind of thinking, thinking psychoanalytically in a way that can be kind of useful and helpful for everyone in a quite practical way, not just, you know, I much prefer to, to, to read this kind of thing or think about this kind of thing than, you know, I mean, not no offence to other psychoanalytic colleagues, but some of their books I can't even understand after doing oh, yeah, three degrees. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and it means nothing to me, you know, so mm-hmm. I think it's really important to have these conversations in a way that people can process and yeah and I really make... liked your book too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really thanks. did no I really did <laughs> um anyway thanks so much for joining us Anishka I've really really enjoyed the, the conversation me too um, yeah it's been really fun and um yeah let, let's um well I'm sure you'll have another book soon you've, you've not you've got so many we can have you back <laughs> on <laughs> yay <laughs> <laughs> and chat again
If you enjoy these videos, you should click on the subscribe button and click that bell. You should also consider supporting me on Patreon. Patrons get access to a second behind the scenes parrot room discussion where we dish out gossip or go into the weeds on topics such as the tendency of the rate of profit to decline, imperialism, and the critical theories of Tiffany Percet and Donald Most. You'll also get access to both the public and private version of the revised Pop the Left series with Ashley Frawley and Pascal Robert, and the new Zoomer Philosophy series. Your support will not only make content like this possible, it will also help to establish a new publishing venture through Diet Soap Media. Right now, supporting me on Patreon will make a big difference.